Welcome back. I'm speaking with representatives Vito Barbieri and Daryl Bowles, uh, members of the House, both. And we've been talking about the budget process, and you're saying that the forecast, the economic forecast is 4.8? 4.5% above growth. 4.5 over last year? Over last year. And the entire budget will be? Well, the general fund budget is general set fund. to be $2.667 billion. Now, when you talk about the total budget, you're going to be up at the 5 to $6 billion budget, but that's with all of the Medicaid and all the federal money that comes into it as well. Six, and six, dedicated. seven, Hans. At least it's not six, 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Wow, that's a lot of money. And it's it, a lot of money, but it's uh, if you go back before the downturn, we were suiting uh, general fund budget right over three billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, I I can tell you, I'm seeing uh, in the real estate industry, I'm seeing that the uh, housing industry seems to be the market seems to be uh, better yeah. in, improving. Just how sustainable that is, I don't know. You know, because we still have homes that have not come on the market that are going through the foreclosure process, unfortunately. But I'm always interested in knowing uh, what the, uh, you get different reports from different people in terms of the economic outlook. Down in the Magic Valley, of course, they've got that Giovanni yogurt factory coming in, and Glambia's now moving their headquarters there. They seem to be just red hot down there. Um, I spoke with Dwight. Uh, Johnson from the Department, Labor Department, and he said Treasure Valley was kind of the last one into the dumpster, right. and we may be close to the last it's one out, out, unfortunately. Yeah. As long as we're climbing out, that's right. Um, Representative Barbieri, you have something here that you handed me. Looks like it's an RS. Sets out the Land Use Planning Act for the purpose, among other things, to protect protect property rights. Now, are we talking private property rights? Private property rights. It's not an RS yet. It's still in draft form. Okay. What we're doing is we're looking to modify the Land Use uh, Planning Act. Right now, this code requires all the states, all the uh, cities and counties to put together uh, land use planning. We want to make that an option. But if they choose to put that plan together, then they must also uh, have a property rights council. The code section says that we need to protect the property rights, but there's no real mechanism that's available to protect the taxpayers in the zoning and planning uh, uh, portion of, you know, setting things up. So we're looking to try and set up a uh, property rights council. There is one being set up in the county north of us in Bonner, and it's already going. It's got seven members, uh, of which there are uh, uh, property owners that are a part of that council. In the draft we're looking at, we want to try and require at least one residential property owner, at least one commercial property owner, and a retail uh, store owner. doesn't have to own the property, but if he's a real steel, retail store operator, then he's also a taxpayer and, and it's, uh, uh, zoning impacts him. And then if there's agriculture, we think that an agriculture owner should be a part of that council too. That way they have some sway as to how the zoning commission works and can have some recommendations, give recommendations uh, to the local government about the, the uh, local planning commission's work. Well, you know, the Kelo case it comes to mind when you start talking about property rights and zoning and then you start thinking about eminent domain and some of the things that we've seen happen over the last few years where people's private property rights are just trampled on. So. It, this is an effort to try and avoid that sort of thing. This is an effort to begin to address that issue. Now, of course, that particular case, I believe, is uh, a little different in terms of talking about urban development and mm -hmm. what they were able to do, and that does have a, a, a place in this, but just the overall uh, plan, uh, uh, land use plan, need not encompass uh, urban development organizations at all. Okay, I'm just I'm just thinking when somebody says um, you're the highest and best use, right? That's the term they always use uh, of this land is. When it's somebody's private property, it seems to me that they can they should be able to determine as long as they're following the rules and operating within the guidelines, but but that can be changed on them and they 
have no say in that. To a large extent, the individuals in, in Bonner County I mentioned earlier are concerned a lot about international pressure through the UN uh, Agenda 21 mm -hmm. program. A lot of that is being uh, established by council uh, consultants, consulting agencies that have been working in this area and so a locality that determines that they need to get out and get a comprehensive plan put together will go to consultation companies that are familiar with and utilizing the same, they're not going to reinvent the wheel, they're going to utilize the same uh, uh, basic template and uh, for instance some of the pushes to you can't divide, subdivide land less than 10 acres that'll keep people from moving out into the areas mm -hmm. that are uh, in, in more rural because they can't afford 10 but they could afford 5 so if you were able to to uh, have a less a smaller parcel then that allows more people to move out of that area and so there's just some population control sure. issues with agenda 21 that this particular property rights uh, council in, in Bonner County is beginning to address and we think it's something that needs to be addressed statewide I know back in the late 90s here in uh, Boise in the Treasure Valley, uh, Ada County in particular, uh, there was a move that uh, the way that zoning was, if you had 40 acres or more, you could break it into 10 acre parcels and uh, uh, development was going along pretty well. There was a move to change the comprehensive plan so that you had to have even more and you couldn't, you could only divide it into smaller. Well, the problem was that you had some farmers that had farmed all their lives, they wanted to pass it on to their children or because of whatever, they wanted to sell to developers and they were actually down, trying to uh, down zone yeah. their properties and there was quite a battle uh, on that. So anytime you affect somebody's private property rights, I think it's good to have the people involved. Especially taxpayers, I think. It's Absolutely. a good idea to have taxpayers involved. It's private. Okay, so this is just in a discussion, very formative stages. Yes, we hope to have an RS here within the next, uh, which is a routing slip, which is the beginning stage, uh, mm -hmm. within the next week. But I've got a couple of other individuals <coughs> I want to run it by and, and make sure they, uh, you know, see the language and understand it, make sure it's understandable. Well, make sure that everybody's <laughs> represented, right. you know, that owns private property, that, um, Okay, well, what time, when are you guys going to go home? <laughs> <laughs> for good or just for a weekend? <laughs> Gerald is, Gerald I'm talking is about when do you sign, when, when do you think you're going to sign a doc? Oh, oh, yeah, that's a good question. We finish setting budgets on March 9th, okay? And typically it's two to two and a half weeks after that when you can sunny die okay and I say can because it just depends upon whether or not that you have any major issues that have to be determined yet, okay? So it usually is somewhere around the first of April. Tip, tip if you look back over the last 10 years, we've averaged about the same number of days with every session, and we're generally getting out around the first part of April, okay? okay? And I know the speaker and leadership in the House have said that that's their target. I've heard everywhere from the 25th of March till somewhere around the first of April. And so what is the see. cost of every day the legislature's in session? Well, I know what it is now. I know in the last few years they used to say somewhere around $30,000 a day, and that's for legislative salary, pay, and everything, plus all of the staff and everything, okay? When you talk about numbers as far as the legislative cost, you know, you have to keep in mind that the entire legislature is cost is less than one quarter of one percent of the entire state budget. Well, and I'm also aware that you, when people come into town, it's good for the local economy because yeah. of, of obviously their consumption. But it's it's kind of a figure that people are always curious mm -hmm. about. So I'd like to cover that. Um, I have a question uh, for you now, Vito. I know that this station has been concerned about um, a bill that just came out of a committee that you s sit on and I guess it'll be going to the House floor for a vote here fairly soon. Yes. It's the Video, what is it? Service Act, I think. Video, Video Service, Service Act. Act. Will you talk just a moment about that? Well, briefly, the it's an, a bill that's been in formation and been attempted several times over the last four or five years. And uh, finally, there's been an agreement between the cable service providers and the uh, local governments, uh, basically the stakeholders, with respect to franchise fees which are paid from the cable providers to the local governments basically as an exchange for the right-of-way, using the right-of-way. 
there's been an agreement whereby a, a company that may want to compete with an existing, what they call an incumbent provider, a company that may, a new company that may want to come in and compete with that can f license or franchise with the state. Now, it's not a statewide franchise, but they would license or franchise with the state, and that would allow them to build out, which is to say to lay the fiber optic and the cable in an area, an entire geographical area, say Boise, and then there would be two providers of video services within the uh, metro area of, of Boise. When you talk about that, the, they're saying that it's prohibitive to expect the service agents, the service companies, the cable service companies, to go to each city and negotiate. So this will allow them uh, in a competitive way to, uh, to lay the groundwork, build out, so that they can actually set into place a competing infrastructure for uh, cable service. The stickler was for stations such as these, which we call PEGs, public education and government channels, is that there, in Boise particularly, there was a 10 cent charge on all of the subscribers, each of the subs subscribers in Boise, a 10 cent charge, itemized on the bill that went directly to this particular channel. You're talking about, take for instance, if I get it's somebody that gets their cable bill, there's a 10 cent charge that would go like to this station. Directly to this station. Okay. A little more than $8,000 a quarter, um, okay. approximately $32,000, $33,000 a year uh, projected out. That compares to about a million dollars, a little more than a million dollars a year that would go to the city, Boise for the franchise fee. Now, I don't know what that percentage is, whether it's, uh, but I know that if they, the cable provider franchises with the state, then it automatically jumps to a 5% franchise fee to the local government. Now, because this bill has eliminated that 10 cents, and it would have been eliminated anyway sometime at the end of the year because the contract, as I understand it, would be over, but that 10 cents is now not included in the bill, not included in the law. So stations such as this will have to become uh, more innovative and... and uh, They'll be impacted by about $32,000. Yeah, they'll be more innovative in bringing in revenues and, of course, have to go to the city and work out some way that the city can begin to contribute more to make sure that these stations are alive and that, you know, individual First Amendment uh, rights are kept alive. Okay, and uh, how does, uh, say, Channel 4 fit into all of this? That's a public... But it's, it's also the university, and it's funded through the it's university. It's a totally different animal in the sense that the bill that we're talking about, having just passed the uh, business committee, will force or require that the cable operators furnish, free of charge, two channels. And that would be, uh, is this 11 and 98? I think those are the two channels that, that are used by this cable or this uh, TV uh, network. So if it's less than 50,000, I think that's the number of people in the, in the uh, metro Super. area, then it's only one channel would be required. So in that sense, it's, it's not the same. PBS is paying where, for, for that access to the cable, paying to be on that cable uh, service provider, whereas in this case, it's furnished to you as a part of the contract with the state. Does that make sense? Really hard to get your brain around yeah, that one. Really it tough. really is. It's, it's a, a complex issue. I'm trying to figure out why it was brought forward. I mean, what was the whole purpose of the The reasons it was brought forward that, that were made to us was so that competition could be brought to metro areas. It's okay. too expensive to build out if you have to go to each individual area and negotiate a separate contract. Well, that we could do a whole I other program could. on mm -hmm. that. And we're unfortunately out of time. Um, if people want to get hold of either one of you, you can go to FYIIdaho.com and there's a link to the legislature. You can get hold of these gentlemen. You can read bills. I encourage you to read the bills. Um, and keep their feet to the fire. Thanks for joining us.